Welcome to episode 383 of We Don't Die Radio. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And before we start, just a few announcements. First of all, our home base is wedontdie.com. And we always have some very inspiring things going on. Don't miss our free Sunday gathering. It's a spiritual service, but with so much more. It's filled with fun, joy, smiles, music videos, and there is a medium demonstration. We've got some new upcoming classes, psychic, mediumship, and then a brand new spirit guides, inspirers, and teachers. Those people that help us in the invisible world. And if you're listening to this two years in advance, or you know what I'm saying, two years from now, not to worry, you will still be able to find that on the store page at wedontdie.com. Now, this is a video episode. So if you are listening on your favorite podcast and you'd rather be viewing myself and our wonderful guest, just head over to YouTube and type in the search We Don't Die Radio 383. Our guest today is Jan Warner. Jan has worked in child abuse and suicide preventions, and she has one of the few people who has been to all seven continents. She has produced a documentary films and an off Broadway play and says her favorite role in life is being a grandmother. Well, why is she our guest today, you may ask? Well, because Jan knows firsthand the devastating impact of grief when her husband passed, and now she is making a profound difference globally. She began a Facebook page called Grief Speaks Out, and now it has a worldwide community of two and a half million followers. She's also the author of the book, Grief Day by Day, Simple Practices and Daily Guidance for Living with Loss. She has also contributed a chapter to Gathering at the Doorway, this one, and an anthology of signs, visits, and messages from the afterlife. You can find out more at her website, which is griefdaybyday.com, which will direct you to her blog. And also, if you're a Facebook follower, you can just go to Grief Speaks Out. Type that in the search box, Grief Speaks Out. So let's welcome her, Jan Warner, a warm welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much. Um, when you say it all together like that, I feel like I should take a nap. So <laughs> thank you so much for um, uh, just being nice and asking me on your show. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm thrilled. You know, grief is the whole reason I talk about the afterlife. I was never going to mention anything that I knew, except for when I experienced grief really firsthand. And I thought, you know what, people need to know everything I know, including about grief. So we are like-minded souls coming from a different pathway. But anyways, let's hear from you a little bit about you and your past. I, I'm amazed at uh, some of the things that you've done. Tell us a little bit about your past and then we can get into uh, the grief and why you're doing what you're doing. Well, when I was working as a temporary secretary in New York City, such a long time ago, um, they had typewriters um, instead of computers, which really dates me and phones that were plugged into the wall. And a woman who was about 65, I'm 71 now, said to me when I was going to Europe for the summer, I wish I had done that when I was young. And so she changed my life because when I got to her age, now I'm older than she was, I wanted to be able to say I either did it or I tried to do it. So my life is like the list you said, sounds full of accomplishments and exciting bits. You could also edit my life and show me laying in bed in my pajamas at noon, trying to talk myself into getting up. When my husband first died, he was older than I was. And I thought that I would be sad. I thought I would miss him. I didn't know I would feel like a house in a hurricane that was totally blown to bits. So I hardly moved at all after he first passed. And so my past is like a smorgasbord of trying to have different experiences for myself and then also allowing time for myself just to collapse and say, I can't do any of this and then see what I'm going to do next, whether I can or not. Yeah, big hugs to you. How did you meet your husband? <laughs> um, I, 
I owned a bookstore in Phoenix, Arizona called The Turning Page. And he walked in and he asked me for a book and he gave me his card. I gave him my card and he said, could I, he called me and um, I'm sorry, it was, it was a long time ago, but I called everybody. I said, I met this man and there was this connection and it was really wonderful. I didn't call me. And he didn't call me and a month went by and the phone rang in the store and I said, I know who you are. I recognize your voice. And you could hear by his silence that he was suspicious. And he had used my phone in the store because they didn't have cell phones in those days to ask somebody about a bathing suit he's left somewhere. And I said, did you ever get your bathing suit back? And he knew that I did remember him. And he said, would you come over to my condo tonight? And I said, yes. And then I'm driving going, wait a minute, I don't do this. Why am I going to this strange person's condo? And then uh, we got married 10 years later because he was the poster boy for men who can't commit. And we were married for 13 years. And then so 23 years of um, really deep, deep love and also challenges. I always tell people that it wasn't a perfect marriage. We fought all the time. Somebody said to me once, it's okay in, in a while, you'll just have good memories. And they said, are you kidding me? I wanna remember him the way he was. I, I miss all of it. I miss, and I, I, I apologized to him all the time because there are things I didn't understand about him until after he died. And I, that's what I, to me, I believe in life after death because it allows me to survive. And I say that if I say, you know what? I don't believe in Paris and I don't believe in Tokyo. It has no effect. They're still real. It still exists. So whether I believe in the afterlife or not is really irrelevant. But for me, it doesn't make sense that this incredible journey would just be over. So um, I have lots more evidence that he's around like right now saying, oh, keep talking about me. Uh yeah, well, I, we, we, we want to meet him because I know he's had challenges in his life, human life, but he's made a difference with so many people. So if you could tell us his name and, and brag about him a little bit and some of the difference he's made. Um, his name is Artie, Arthur Warner. And I, I, I asked, so I'm allowed to break his anonymity because he's dead, transitioned, passed away, whatever word you like to use. He was a recovering alcoholic. And when he was a drunk, it was before I met him, but he was a homeless drunk. He was not, um, some people call it um, a cocktail table drunk. He was, booze was his life. I said to him, when you were homeless, did you ever look at people and wonder why do they have a home and I don't? And he said, no, I was just wondering how I could score my next drink. So booze was his whole life. And even after he'd been sober over 30 years, he would dream that he was drinking and he'd wake up frightened. So he made Alcoholics Anonymous the center of his life. And he used to say that he didn't do that much good. But when I first met him, he said that I would always come forth, that there was God, the program, and other people in the program. And then there was me. And that was the only way we could have a relationship. But when he was dying, um, he had a hospital bed in the living room and I left the front door open from 10 in the morning till 10 at night because I just couldn't handle the idea of people calling me and sketch so anybody could come and I'd say I don't know three four five hundred people came to say I love you and thank you for my sobriety thank you for saving my life and this was a man who was always hard on himself and he looked at me and he said I guess I did some good in the world. And I said, yep, that's what I've been telling you. Um, I guess my life was worth something. I said, yes, it's always been worth quite a lot. So, he, well, I'm just gonna keep going because- Keep going. Uh, when he died, I first I thought he would come get me and I literally would put my arm up in the air and wait for him to grab it. And I had this weird vision of him like grabbing my hand and I lived in an apartment building. So he'd have to like theoretically say to people, um, excuse me, I'm just going down through your apartment to get to my wife. I thought I was one of those people that would die. I just did have a broken heart and I didn't. So after a while, I thought, well, maybe I should go to him. But, yeah, maybe. And then I went, no, I can't take my own life because 
I can't give this grief that I'm experiencing to people that love me. So then it was like, um, he, he, he came from a rough background, so he's a little bit thuggy, but he liked us to call each other our raison d'etre. So if my reason for being was dead, what was my reason for being? And I went, hmm, he was always available to other addicts and alcoholics. I could be available to other grieving people and honor him. And if I reach one person, that's enough. And so I started a blog. And all these years later, I part of the reason I hope we get to be together again in the same form is I, I just wonder what he thinks about the fact that I turned his death into a career because that was not my intention. <laughs> but it's it's just mind boggling to me. I had emails this past year from a woman in Mongolia and a woman in Malaysia that people all over the world come together in a group because no matter what our culture is or no matter what our politics are, when you lose somebody you love, you just it tears you to pieces and a lot of people don't want to talk about it. So I have a safe space for them to do that. Absolutely. Grief is a silent killer. It's got a world of its own. And if you don't understand it, many people decide to check out. So the blog came first, Jan, and then how did the Facebook group or Facebook page, community page and the book come about? Well, the Facebook page came about because somebody said, you have to start a Facebook page. And I went, oh, um, okay, so I sort of did whatever you need to do to make a Facebook page. And she said, um, oh, I went to your Facebook page and I checked like, and I went, uh oh, I better put something on it. <laughs> and I remember trying to get the first hundred likes and thinking a thousand was respectable. So if I could get a thousand, then I would keep doing it. And I never, in my wildest of dreams, realized that I would have over 2.4 million people and that I would have a worldwide audience. And there, there are, I mean, I, I, I share, as I'll do with you, as I share from my heart, I respect grief. It's a safe space. Now I have to, because Facebook has gotten a little strange, I need to go on twice a day. And um, I block predators. I insist like with AA that you share your own experience. So if somebody says that you have, you could say anything you want, but you have to say in my experience, because I have Jewish people and Muslims and Christians and Wiccans and um, everybody, everybody, everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I say, you know, this is my experience, then you could take from it what you want. And I, I don't, I mean, like I, I met you a few minutes ago. I can tell you what I've been through and how I've handled it. But for me to tell you how to deal with your grief, I think would be rude. When people say, what do, what do you say to a grieving people? Uh, I always say, don't talk, listen. And also ask them what they miss about the person that died. So, yeah. And what's uh, so, on? So the book, they, I opened an email. I was always going to write the great American novel and never did. And I opened my email one day and it said, we'd like to talk to you about writing a book on grief. And I went, okay, I can answer the email and then I can listen and then I can. So they found me because I had so many followers. So that was how the book came about. And what is on the Facebook page? Do you think that has so many people continue to be engaged? Pretend I, you didn't know about your group, you know, group, what would have you be there? Um, Two things. Well, there's a couple things. One is just regular posting that there are seven different posts every day. So when you come, you get material. So there are quotes and pictures with quotes. There's quotes from famous authors and quotes that I make up. There's always also a question of the day, which I either take from what other people want to know. And sometimes I will ask a question that somebody wants to know about has anybody else had people stop speaking to them? Has Does anybody else feel like they wanna die? Has anybody else, I just think of anything you wanna know about grief. And I've gotten over like 150 responses. So people have a really good sense that the two things that they say is, oh, I'm not crazy. And oh, I'm not alone. And also that I keep the page safe. So if somebody says, get over it, um, that it gets hidden immediately. And I will write a little thing saying, the page is called Grief Speaks Out. It's not called Grief Remains Silent. And I do 
insist that people share their own experience and say prayers are always welcome. But um, so I think it, it feels like a really safe space. Plus, I also I, I share from my heart. I talk about one of the fights I had with the book was um, they wanted to call it's it's divided into 52 weeks and each week has a subject and one of them is suicide. And they wanted me to call it contemplating the end. And I said, no, people that are thinking about suicide are not contemplating the end. They're going out and buying a gun and sitting it within their lap, deciding whether or not to shoot themselves. So if you they open my book and they look for suicide and they don't see it, it's your fault. So I insist on that. So I, I do remind people if I ask a question like, did you ever consider taking your own life? Remember you're on Facebook and it's a public page. So that, because um, sometimes people forget and uh, but people are really open and they're 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 really good at sharing things that you know I didn't change the sheet for three months after my husband died and I went to a bereavement group and somebody didn't change the sheets for a year and then somebody else never changed them so everything I've done or you've done or anybody's done somebody else has done um, there was one woman that wrote that um, she's been grieving for her daughter for 74 years and somebody else wrote that he was in his 70s and his father had died when he was a child. And every day of his life, he wonders, sorry, what would his life would have been like if his father was alive. So people know that it's not something that you're gonna get over in six months to a year, but hopefully you'll be able to come alive and have more like I have. All these things that I've done that are magical, um, I could, if you had told me they were going to happen, I would have said, no, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in bed. I bought a plaque that said, have an adequate day because it made me laugh because I could have an adequate day. I couldn't have a good day. It was impossible. Now I have good days. Oh, wow. We have grief. Oh, to me, it's the worst thing we'll ever face, deal with. And it's going to happen multiple times, especially the older that we get. And it's not understood. Nobody really teaches about it and then all of a sudden it's in your face and to find your Facebook page and be able to go hey I'm not alone in this hey I thought I was losing my mind and losing my memory look at all these people that the same thing happens I've lost friends and siblings and things hey I'm not alone it mm -hmm. makes a world of difference I know to know that you're not alone so kudos to you and to your whole community for all the the wonderful posts. Before we get into the magic, let's just talk a little bit about your book because um, talk about how you designed it in the in the fifty two weeks. You know, just give us a little. Preview. Well, I actually didn't design it. I was given an outline, which at the beginning I didn't like, but I like now. So there's fifty two sections. Each one is a topic having to do with grief. Some people start the book at the beginning and read all the way through. Some people just look for what they're feeling. So there's despair, loneliness, fog, self-care. Every five weeks, there's what I call resting spaces. So there's chapters called hope and beauty and music. So if you're feeling like you're so lonely that you can't stand it, you might like want to just look to the chapter on loneliness. And then in each chapter, there are quotes, there's seven quotes, one for each day, finding um, 365 quotes, uh, thank you goodreads.com, it was not that easy sometimes. So you get the wisdom of all these amazing authors. And then there's my commentary about what I feel about that subject. And then there is a, a specific exercise that you can do. Some of them you may have seen somewhere else, some of them you won't because I made them up. I have a master's in counseling. I have training in hypnotherapy and um, neurolinguistic programming. So I have a good background. And plus, I have a very creative mind. So it's a it's a good the the my favorite. Um, on, if you go to Amazon.com, Grief Day by Day by Jan Warner, it has I think over eighteen hundred reviews now, and most of them are five star. But my favorite one is somebody said I hate to read. And I read, I just, I love your book because it's just my companion and I can pick it up and I can read what I need and put it down. And then other people say the opposite that they, they, they've started at the beginning and they're going through it a second time. I'm so proud of you. What a gift. 
What a gift. Oh, well, let's talk about now. Well, grief doesn't go away. It may lessen that massive weight on your chest, um, but it, it doesn't go away. What happened that started opening you up to Artie and the afterlife possibility? Well, uh, the first thing, um, we live together in Carmel, California, which is beautiful, but I'm a New York City girl. And people would say, how long are you gonna live in Carmel? And I said, I hope my husband never dies, but I'll live here till he dies. And it took me a few months to pack everything up. And I went to the UPS store, I, I needed two more boxes. And there was a man that worked there and he knew Artie and me, but he knew us as customers. I mean, he'd seen us, you know, whenever we walked in the store. And he was short, slight, he had wire room glasses, a very ordinary person. And he said, can I carry the boxes to your car? And I said, no, it's okay, I got it. He said, please let me carry the boxes to your car. And I said, all right. And he carried the boxes to my car and he looked at me and he said, your husband came to me and told me that I have to give you a message. I have to tell you how much he loves you and that you have to keep remembering and know how much he loves you. And it's interesting, I'm getting emotional because this was 13 years ago. Um, and I laughed and I said, that must have been a heck of a dream. And he said, no, you're not listening to me. It wasn't a dream, it was an apparition. Your husband appeared to me and he gave you this, gave me this message for you. And I, I did turn it into a joke because now I say, and what does UPS deliver to you? So if it had been a friend or a relation, I would have said, well, they're just trying to make me feel better. Right. But there was absolutely no reason for this person to have this experience if my husband had not actually appeared to him. And I think in a way, my husband had sort of a wicked sense of humor. So um, I, and I just got that, that perhaps he picked somebody from UPS because it was an important message to be delivered. I, I, don't, I don't know, I'll have to ask him. Um, that's what other, you know, I have questions. So I'm hoping that um, we get to have these chats in person as opposed to, I mean, I hear them all the time. I call them taps on the head because it's just a thought that doesn't feel like it's coming from inside my head. It feels like it's coming from outside. Oh, talk, oh, talk more about that. Cause I think I, I read that um, you'd first started working with a medium or you had a medium friend and then you realized you can do this on your own. Am I right? Something like that? Or one of my really good friends who I trusted very much is a psychic and she also does medium work, but she doesn't like to do it. And she had only met Artie once. And I had a call with her once a year for a while. And she knew things she couldn't possibly know. Like she always ended the call by saying, um, and he's throwing flowers at you. He's, bow he's bowing away. And then one time she said, I don't know why, but he's throwing small stuffed animals at you. That doesn't make any sense. Well, that was what he always gave me. He knew I like small stuffed animals. So she had no way of knowing that. On the first call, she said, he said, when you go to sleep, I don't know, you pull something over you that's like a blanket, but it's not a blanket. And he said that that's how he's holding you. And every night when I went to sleep, I had a slanket, which was that blanket with sleeves in it. I don't know if they still have them. And every night before I went to sleep, I pulled it over my shoulder. So it was quite amazing. And I even had this weird thing where, cause I was angry. It's like, how could you leave me? I need arms. I need you to be here physically. And he said, if you need arms, find arms. If you need to be loved, find somebody that will love you. And then after the phone call was over, I was out walking and I swear I heard him say, you know that stuff I said about you finding somebody else? I just said that because I didn't want to like disappoint Karen. I don't want to find anybody else. <laughs> so, you know, somebody once asked me, do you joke with your dead? And I thought that was a great question. So yeah, I joke with my dead. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so emotional this morning. That's really it's, funny. It's all good. It's all good. Um, <laughs> these conversations. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you tap into your memories and your love and all that stuff. I've done between this show and then I also have a show on iHeartRadio called Shades of the Afterlife. And I'm approaching 500 episodes with different That's conversations great. all over. I know that nobody convinced me, can convince me that we go on, that we are real people 
that we can see each other, you'll be able to hug each other, you'll have those conversations, you'll have a lot of laughs. We are not balls of energy, we are very, very real. And so it, it doesn't really help us with grief, but I know being on this exploration, kind of like you are as well, and keeping the relationship alive is so much healthier than you know us dying inside and refusing to be open, refusing to believe. No. And it, it, it well, it helps me because I remind people all the time that in terms of eternity, my life is very short. So if we in truth have eternity together, it's, I call it decorating the waiting room. A lot of people like that. I'm decorating the waiting room, and I'm and I want him to be proud of me. Uh, you know, I have a I have a letter from him where he said I really admire you because I watch you fall and get up and try again and fall and try and get up again, and. That's what I want him to see as somebody that missed him and loved him and was sad and miss him and love him, um, but kept standing up again. So the collapsing's okay. I love people to say you're wallowing in self pity. I say, of course, I love wallowing in self pity. I just want to time limit it. Um, but from the very beginning, it was showing up and helping others. Those were the two two sort of cornerstones. And the the other big thing that I should stick in here is that. It took me four years to get here, so I just give it away, is his life needs to matter more to me than his death, because it was all about the fact that he was dead. And when dead already makes me sad, alive already makes me happy. So if I believe not only is he, was he alive and did we have this wonderful, I always say we were like symbols in an orchestra, we made a great noise together. Um, he's alive somewhere, and the thought that we'll be together again, my favorite thing on a tombstone is reunited, the great party in the sky. So um, what a disservice to make his death more important than his life. Oh, I love that. I love that. And going back to what you said about the, you know, um, the waiting room or however you said it is, yeah, is somewhere, yeah, somewhere you had said Mary Oliver's question, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I don't know where you got that from, but it really struck me as that's the question we can ask ourselves. It's in a poem and you never, there, there's also Richard Bandler who started your linguistic programming taught me, um, what didn't I say today? Because I was afraid of the result. What did, question didn't I ask? So a lot of experience I've had is that I'm really scared of the question I'm going to ask somebody, but I ask it anyway. And a lot of times I get a great result. I've met some amazing people. I just found a way to um, support buying ambulances for Ukraine. And it's the first time I've ever met somebody that was wearing a suit and a flag pin. Um, and that was like a I didn't think there was any way I could help concretely and it opened up for me because I just started asking around saying do you know anybody in Ukraine where I can help I'm not a doctor or a nurse and I don't want to be a war terrorist to get in the way and so now I'm going to contribute to giving ambulances which are not that expensive because it never occurred to me that they blow up in war so you don't want expensive ambulances so always ask always um keep trying, always look for, and it's hard because the worst thing that grieving does, I think, is, I mean, I was totally paralyzed for a while and I still get that way. I had lunch with somebody the other day and it was really hard to get out of the house. But once I got there, I had a good time. So that's the showing up part. And uh, the helping others when I was totally paralyzed I wasn't totally paralyzed, obviously, but I felt paralyzed emotionally. Um, I would go on Facebook and I would find somebody that was suffering and I would respond to them. And in that moment, I wasn't thinking about me, I was thinking about them. So um, some people I'm still Facebook friends with and some of them are stuck. Some people just can't um, get unstuck, but it's okay to be where you are. And when you're ready, you'll know, and you might, in the, in the chapter on moving, I say, you know, I'm going to ask you to move. And if you want to go for a run, go for a run. But if all you can do is move your little finger, start there. 
Oh, wow, absolutely, absolutely. So can you talk a little bit about the communication with Artie with what you feel and um, how did that start? That you were I, feeling? I don't know if this was the first time, but I, I went, one of the things, I loved theater. So I would go to theater and I would sleep through everything. Um, I even slept through Hugh Jackman and Daniel Craig and I would wake up when people applauded. Um, and then I saw Carrie Fisher, who was very funny and I actually stayed awake and I laughed and I went, this is interesting, I can laugh. I didn't think I would ever laugh again. But I, I went to see um, something, a celebration of Stephen Sondheim and I was kind of feeling sorry for myself. And I heard Artie say, when you used to ask me to go places when I was alive, I used to say no all the time. And now I can come with you everywhere. And it was like, oh, okay. I can take my grief on the road. I don't have to, I can take my grief to um, London. I can take my grief to the grocery store. I don't have to let go to move on. I don't have to let go to, I can take Artie and I can take my grief. As a matter of fact, I did a, I did a one woman show after he died. I, I realized everything was sad. All I was doing was bereavement groups and therapy. And so I started taking um, uh, comedy sketch writing. And the first class people said, why are you here? And my answer was my husband died. So I thought I'd do comedy. And I got a combination of <gasps> and laughs and just like feeding myself, starting to feed myself a little bit of something different. And, um, oh, so I did a one woman show called Pull Me Back. And, but it was about, my husband was in the overhead compartment because he had been cremated and he didn't like to travel. And I really wanted to say to the guy sitting next to me, you know, my husband's in the overhead compartment, but I was afraid I would freak him out. So <laughs> So it, it, it's, it, I have a snarky sense of humor, obviously. So when I lose my sense of humor, I'm in trouble. But you know, often it, it, it's funny, like I, I had, a, um, I didn't like my engagement ring and I never found one I liked. And I was standing in front of a jewelry store in New York and I saw this beautiful ring. And I said, that's what I want for my engagement ring. If Artie was still alive, I'd ask him for it. And he said, thank God I'm dead. I don't have to pay for it. So, I mean, I hear that. I sometimes hear, like, I'll be talking about what I do with Grief Speaks Out. And he'll say, you think it's all you? It's me. You know, he'll have an opinion about something. Um, so one of the things I'm curious about is asking him, was that always you? Or did I make it up? But it, it doesn't matter. That's, that's the thing. When people say that they really want science, but they don't see them. I say, sometimes people, I, I believe that sometimes when people go to the other side, they're busy, they can't, they're not adjusting right away. So they may not be able to be there for you right away. But also a lot of times there's signs all the, around you, you just have to be able to see them. And you have to say, hmm, that's my loved one saying hello. Yeah, they speak so subtly and it's through our imagination They're pointing our eyes in the right direction and noticing. But when we're so busy in our own heads, thinking about the past, the future, all that, we could we could miss them. So also, does it, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I also say, um, I don't know if it's, I think, it, I don't know if it's in the book or not. Um, but either look at a picture or close your eyes and look in your loved one's remembered eyes and listen for what they have to say to you at this point. And if you don't hear anything, it's okay to imagine what they would say because imagination opens the door to communication. And you don't have the answer, really, if they've, they're have they communicating through your imagination or not. So do it as an experiment, try it, see what happens. Because I, nobody could give me better advice than my husband. Nobody would call me up short or give me more support. Because I know some people also believe that we are disturbing our loved ones. And I don't believe that. I believe that time and space is different. So that if I say, Artie, I'm having trouble now, I really need you. It doesn't take him away from anything he needs to do. And that he really wants to care for me when I'm sad or angry. And he delights in me when I'm happy. His nickname for me was Panache. So I still try and be Panache. Oh yeah, I believe we can multitask. 
we mm-hmm. can be doing something there and I'll also be with our loved ones here. I think there's a whole world that we can't even begin to imagine as mm-hmm. human beings about what's possible. And I also believe there's no space and time. So what might seem to us like three days and we haven't gotten a sign, it might just be, you know, a quick second for them or nothing at all. And I saw I saw a program on the universe and it's expanding and it's so big because one of the questions is, well, there's been billions of people. There's no room. Well, there actually is. I mean, if you actually watch something about the universe and how immensely huge it is, there's room for people from all kinds of worlds. Um, and if time and space is different, how we travel to it. I mean, I don't know how many people were with their loved ones when they died, but when he breathed his last breath, he was gone. Uh, it, it, it was visible. I mean, his body was still there. I, you know, I, I made him hug me because I mean, I had to say goodbye to his body too, but whoever Artie Warner was, was gone. And it's quite possible he had gone somewhere. Um, and I think he did, but I don't know how to define it because I'm still in my body. But I'm curious about what happens when I said, so what, what is it somebody says about um, that our bodies are like cocoons and that when we die, we become butterflies and we fly off to where we really belong. I don't know if that's true, but a lot of people are not skeptical at all. Um, and a lot of people are skeptical. Um, my, I, had an, I had an uncle who was an atheist and his whole life. I mean, like a diehard atheist. And his last words were, it's okay, I'm with God. I don't know what he saw. <laughs> Something. Yeah, there's a lot of people that see a lot of things. And I love hearing those kind of stories. Tell us more about the tap you said and how you feel already speaking outside your head. It feels like a tap in the head. My friends are used to it because we'll just be talking and I'll go, well, Artie says. So he doesn't have a voice anymore. So I don't hear a voice. I don't think he has his physical voice. That's the hard thing for me is I can't imagine him without his body because I mean, I love this man as he presented himself to me. Um, So I, it feels like the tap on the head is to get my attention. It's like, hey, I'm talking to you, pay attention. Um, And then I have a thought that doesn't feel like it, it, it comes from my head. I have a thought that feels like it comes from outside. And it could be like something like random, or it could be something he feels like it's important to communicate with me. And it doesn't happen every day. As a matter of fact, um, when I go to sleep now, a lot of times I'll say, and then Artie came home. And I know that's not possible, but there's something just really nice about going to sleep with the idea. Because I, I also said, you know, he's been dead for almost 13 years now and he hasn't visited me once in person. How rude. Um, but he can't. That's the unbearable thing about death is that we're waiting for something that can happen. But in our imaginations, it can happen. And then that thought that he's around me, caring for me. I've also had other people say that they've seen him around me. So, um, I feel like I've had more, like one of his friends said that he always, in AA, he always told people he sponsored to take care of newcomers. If somebody walks in a meeting, make sure you ask them if they want to go for coffee. And somebody said that he appeared at the end of his bed and said, remember the newcomers. I've had friends that have never met him said, um, one of my friends said, I was meditating and I heard Artie say, attaboy, keep it up. So not only does he show up for me, he shows up for other people who um, really have no reason to see him in terms of they only know him through me. So I, I do feel like the evidence I have for him being around and an afterlife is greater than the evidence I have that there isn't one. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love you keeping your sense of humor be fun to hang out with you in person sometime. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and also for people interested, and you said imagination opens the door for communication. It does. But there's, you know, you got to imagine you're two people, um, one on this plane of reality and one on the next. It's not something, or I think it's something they may need to learn how to do. And if you just give them one shot to communicate, then it's over. 
maybe not so good. Maybe mm -hmm. keep up that practice a couple times a week or every day or whatever, uh, and just be open. Oh, I have another one. Sorry, it's I they keep bring them on. The, bring first, him on the yeah. first birthday after he died, I bought a cupcake and a candle, and I lit the candle and I said, "Come on, blow out the candle, blow out the candle," and obviously wasn't going to happen but i visualized him being a spirit and he could just go um, so i blew out the candle and of course ate the cupcake and then i randomly opened a book that i was not interested in reading and i don't know why i opened it and on the front cover of the book there was a note from him that said if you ever wonder how much i love you i'm gonna cry because I love you and I adore you. And you, I mean, it was just this wonderful love note that I didn't remember, had no idea was in the book. And to me, that was a sign. He wasn't gonna do my sign, which was blowing out the candle, but he, he somehow had, why else would I, because I, I don't know if you can see in the background, I've got hundreds and hundreds of books. Why would I pick up this book and open it and find this note that was so powerful and telling me what I needed to hear on that? So yeah, it's, 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 the evidence is there um and it's but it's not it's just the thing about my death is i'd like to be in the same form i think that's part of grief is that i'm in a body and he's not and there's something very lonely about that for me um why are you so sure he's not in a body oh i don't well I always say I'm honest in these things. He could be in a body. I told him to wait. I said, I don't want you to be in a body until I'm ready to go in a body with you. So um, I don't know if he's in a body or not. I don't know if he gets a chance to wait. One of the medium phone calls I had, he said he was offered a body, but he didn't feel like he was ready. He hadn't learned enough where he was. So yes, he could be in a body, but um, that's my jealousy. I want us to go on to the next phase together. <laughs> I think from everybody that I've interviewed, everything I've experienced, everything that I've done, that we, we are mega powerful and our thoughts create our reality. So I think it's comfortable for people when we get over there to see each other and have a world that's very much like we experience it. Mm -hmm. But if Artie is who he sounds like to be, he may choose to not be that until you're together. You know, don't know, he may choose, who knows? Or I could be there and say, out. hey, you know, that's what you wanted, but this was my next step and I had to take it. And, you know, I'm glad you, you know, you've joined me, but you yeah. do. I, I also, I've come to believe that if you're alive, there's a reason. Mm. I didn't think I had a purpose and I was lucky that I was able to find a purpose. So I have great admiration for all the people that have suffered far more tragedies than I have and yet have managed to turn that into doing good for other people. Um, but that's, so that's what, uh, the, it's a poem by Mary Oliver, but that's, um, even though I don't always think my life is precious and sometimes I wish it was over, um, I'm here because I have a reason for being here and um, always look for it. And it could be something really small. It could just be like you're in the grocery store and you say to the checkout person, I really like your hair and they smile. It doesn't need to be that you started a Facebook page that ha has however many things. Or written a book or any of that big yeah. things. No, it's it, little things. It's really small. I mean, you know, uh, Mother Teresa said, if you want to change the world, stay home and love your family. So. Beautiful. But it all starts with making a difference for another, whether it's just a compliment, which could change somebody's life, <laughs> really can. So I want to talk to you now about our mutual love, because you and I have both contributed to gathering at the doorway. How did this come about for you, uh, meeting Camille and being part of this beautiful book, Anthology of Signs, Visits, and Messages? From I'm here? not 100% sure, but I'm <laughs> like 99% sure. Uh, Jane Asher recommended me. Jane had asked me to be on her show, and we've become long-distance friends. I think she's absolutely amazing. So when Camille contacted her, she said, I know Jan Warner. I think she'd be really good at contributing a chapter to your book. So Camille asked me to do that. And it was, I could do that. 
So um, that was how that happened. I was very honored to be asked and included, especially since um, one of the things I love about the book is that there's so many people that have no doubts at all. So those are my favorite people to be around because they reinforce the part of me that really truly wants to believe 100%. Yeah, yeah. And Jane introduced us and Jane was two episodes ago on episode 381. So nobody wants to miss that. Absolutely. And but she has no doubts. I mean, she wrote her yeah. book with her mother and she would not question as I do that she really wrote her book with her mother. So it, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. It, it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, my friend Stephen Simon, who was the producer of What Dreams May Come, the great movie with Robin Williams, he has co-written a book with his wife, who is in the afterlife. And he said, not a single person can convince him that it wasn't her voice speaking and helping with this. And he says he, he feels her, similar mm -hmm. to you and the voice, and he just knows. And there's always going to be skeptics, always. I don't think we should ever push our stuff, our right. stuff itself on anybody. But be open and the signs are there my goodness by day, by day i mean Artie guides me all the time i mean just even starting it i mean my intention was to honor his work but i never do anything repeatedly you know I, i'm somebody that picks up something and then stops but for i don't know maybe 10 years i do grief speaks out every day I never miss a day. Um, there's a pattern now in the beginning, I was just figuring out how to post things. Um, so the fact that it's something that I do that's helpful to people, I think is he's there, you know, he's pulling my hand and saying, you know, set the, if you don't want to post now and you have posted ahead, set the alarm for four in the morning. And, you know, the posts are posted between six and 6.30 every morning. and. Um, if I'm going to be away, I tell people, you know, please be patient with the predators. I'll knock them off as soon as I have internet again. Um, but yeah, I, he guides me. Um, and if, if you don't believe, if you're an atheist um, or you believe that there is no life after death, the person's still part of you. They're still part of your heart. They're part of your mind. They're, they're still with you in so many ways that you can still honor them. Um, so I don't, I just, I just find it comforting. I, I, I started saying recently, if I created the world, if I had been God, I would have picked like a random day, like Tuesday, nobody died on Tuesdays because we need a break. It's just one of the posts every day. is just a heart and the heart doesn't get very many shares, but I don't care because the page is about sadness and pain, but it's mainly about love. You know, I used to say Artie was the most alive dead person I know, but he's not there are a lot of alive dead people and they're alive because of the love that people have for them. And it doesn't matter. This is, sorry. I, I had a very nice therapist, but this idea that in six months to a year, you get over it is so completely ludicrous because number one, why would you want to, if somebody is such an important part of your life, you want to remember them, but you find there was a, a, a psychologist, Dr. Stolaro, whose wife had died. He said, you find a relational home for grief you make grief a part of your being so it doesn't take over and keep you in the black hole. But I, I, I can be a grieving person and a happy person at the same time. I, I, I um, confused um, somebody that interviewed me because she said, what do you want to call it? And I said, well, let's call it celebrating grief. She went, celebrating grief? How could you celebrate grief? And I said, because of love. Um, the saddest story I ever heard was about a man who was crying at his wife's funeral and everybody thought he was crying because he was sad and he was crying because he wasn't sad. And he thought that after being married for so many years, he deserved to be really sad and his wife deserved somebody to grieve for her. So he was crying about his lack of grief. My parents were not, um, let's say they were damaged. That's the softest way to say it. I have no grief for my parents. And when I read about people talking about their grief for their mother or their father, that's a gift to them because they had that relationship that they're going to grieve. Yeah, so I think so. It, it shows rather, us. Rather have already alive, sure. Yeah. Yes. Like, it's not like I'm not one of these people that say, oh, thank God I was beaten up regularly or thank God this horrible thing. No, I don't believe that. Um, 
but um and also i'm not sure he would have handled my death very well so it's a sacrifice i would really make is to find my way through it instead of burdening him with having to find his way through it so yeah our grief really represents how much love we're capable of loving yes i think part of being human is really to practice and build up that love muscle and yeah um exactly right exactly right everyone should pat themselves on the back for knowing how lovable and loving they are well we have a few minutes left jan where would you like to go is there anything left unsaid anything else you want to share i was very honored once a 16 year old asked me to be on her show and because i'm 71 i was a little bit younger then um it was interesting that she wanted me to be on a show called Teen Grief. And she asked me a question. And she said, what would you say to a teenager? And I had a, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. So most questions I can answer fairly easily because I've thought about it over and over again. But that stopped me. And I thought, keep, keep trying, stay alive. I know you're in a lot of pain, but you can't see around corners. So especially with COVID, with war. My poor granddaughter's 10 and she said, I've had a pandemic for two years and Putin says, oh good, let's have a war. Can I have my child with back? Um, you have to also be able to look at all the awesome people. I have a friend that's working on a musical called Super You and she has something called the Super Foundation. I am loved, I am enough. Together we can change the world. I believe in you. So don't look at yourself through your own eyes. Look at your eyes through somebody who loved you. Even, I know sometimes people aren't sympathetic if you've had a miscarriage, but you love that baby. And that's just as real grief as if you've been together with somebody for 70 years. Sometimes people are weird about pets my daughter's dogs are her best friends so grief is unbearable grief is painful grief is horrible but how do you learn to like let some light in how do you learn to let yourself feel the love and then how do you keep telling your story when i started doing storytelling i was really scared because the first show i did it was comedy 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 death comedy 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 i had some laugh lines but and afterwards, people came up to me and shook my hand and said, thank you for sharing and thank you for doing that. So um, look around and see what might interest you and see what you can find. David Byrne has a, a, a website called Reasons to be Cheerful, and he finds things around the world where people are doing wonderful things to save the planet or help each other. So you can spend time looking for that kind of thing as well as finding time it's okay to be where you are. Don't be hard on yourself. It's grief attacks are normal. If you're like doing fine and then all of a sudden you can't get out of bed, look around. Maybe it's an anniversary or a birthday or it's just a day and you can't take it anymore. Don't take it right then, but then see if you can get up and, and, and do something. Mm, thank you for that. I, I, I love it. <laughs> Reasons to be cheerful. Who is that that uh, David Byrne, um, he's, well, I'm forgetting. He's a, he's an amazing singer and I've forgotten the name of his group because I didn't discover him until he was on Broadway, American Utopia. It's, I think it's reasons to be cheerful.com. Okay. We'll check it out. David Byrne is B-Y-R-N-E. Yeah. All right. So we will check it out. So if you would remind us how we can find out more, I know I said it at the beginning, but your website, your Facebook page, et cetera. Would you give so, us the link? Um, the book grief day by day simple practices and daily guidance for living with loss that was not my title um it's rather unwieldy um is on amazon and barnes and noble and if you actually you know what all you have to do is google jan warner and grief and it all comes up because it's very strange now so um, i have the facebook page but instead of giving you a whole bunch of earls and also my email is there's an email at E-Y-E-S-E-E-P-I-C at AOL.com. And if you put grief in the subtitle, I mean, in the subject, I will, I might not answer you right away, 
but I'll answer you eventually. So it's okay to email me and ask me questions, but it's kind of strange to Google myself and, and because I've done podcasts and um, I have the book and the Facebook page and it just, there it is. It all comes up. <laughs> oh, thank you. And if you're watching this right now on YouTube, you can see in the description, I have links to the book and to the blog and to the Facebook page, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Jan, thank you so much for being our guest today. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for, for allowing me to be your guest. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all the work you do. It's like amazing. Oh, you're most welcome. I know all we can do is give and give back when we learn. Um, so I'm grateful to be able to do this and to spend the time with you. And also for our listener or, or for our viewer, thank you for being with us today. Whether this is your first episode or you've listened to all 383, <laughs> I know you're out there. Um, thank you. It takes something. It really does to be proactive and to watch a video or listen to a podcast or read a book. And I just recommend everybody just be proactive somehow. Yes, we want these bolt of lightnings and then these signs to just show up, but we really need to be open. And Jan gave us quite a few tips. So i um, really grateful for her. So as a reminder, our home base is wedontdie.com. And there you can find all the past episodes of this show. There's a link to go check out Shades of the Afterlife. Um, my upcoming episode, number 93, is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, it's everything that I've learned. I actually give listeners a visual meditation to not only connect with their higher self, but also to meet up with it, your loved ones. And it's very special, very, very, very special. And like I said, we have a weekly Sunday gathering that's free and you can be part of the medium demonstration and see all these joyful reunions of people coming through and giving the most heartfelt messages to loved ones, letting them know they're with them. They're very much alive. There's humor, there's joy. You don't need a Kleenex unless it's for happy tears. It really is terrific. Um, also, if you're interested and would like a free copy of my book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death, I'm happy to give one to you. Just go to wedontdie.com, click on the store page, scroll down a little and you'll see the audio book. Use coupon code FREE, F-R-E-E, -E, be my guest to that. Chapter 10 is about surviving grief and without me going through the pain and the devastation of grief and learning about it, I would have never been open and sharing what I know about the afterlife. So everybody I feel needs to be educated through grief um, and get some understanding that it's so much out of your control. The only way to the other side of it is through it, but there are so many things that really make a difference. And I'm really excited to read Jan's book as well, because uh, I just think the weekly and daily practice and things are just great. So in closing, my friends, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I'm always so happy to be here and have these life-changing conversations. I believe that life is an education for our soul and that your life here on earth is very important. So if you're still alive, there's still more to do. And if we can take a little pinch from Jan and direct our attention to others, you just might find more reason reason of being. So I want to thank you for listening or for watching, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>